Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce our leader, Kurt Collier. Uh, Kurt has been a leader of ethical culture societies for 20 years, and i um, very glad to have him here in Bergen County after stints with uh, Riverdale Yonkers and New York Society and others. Um, he also, for 17 years, was the National Youth Programs Director for the United States Park Service, working with Groundworks USA, uh, and where he uh, helped bring that, those two important um, experiences uh, and skills together this past summer as we uh, supported a youth jobs program uh, that helped uh, more than 20 young people get their uh, training in construction and certification and also to uh, to make some money and do some good in uh, local parks. So without further ado, uh, Kurt Collier on how to raise an ethical child. I do wanna point out that we had a very successful summer youth employment program. Uh, for those who didn't hear me say it last week, uh, we got to hire uh, just four youth here, but we helped the New York Society however, hire another five youth and then we worked with 15 youth on construction projects uh, across the county. This is the team that we had here. So I wanted to put a picture of our uh, youth, uh, many of them which have connections to the Ethical Society, it came to find out, so it's really great. And it participated in other ways. It's important that we remember that the Ethical Society is committed not only to improving the lives of people, but the lives of our natural world and the rest of being as well. And that for us to remember that we have a commitment to things outside of this building and to others. And, a, and uh, it was a really, really, really great summer. Uh, we're still working on that project. It's a massive uh, restoration project uh, in a park, which is heavily damaged by a hurricane, of uh, putting approximately 20 tons of rock in there, 20 tons, I said it correctly, uh, and moving them with cranes and all this kind of stuff. And uh, it is a project that I've been supervising there and teaching people how to, to do construction and use survey equipment. It's a, quite a big project, but the idea is to eventually create a space where we can have a healthier stream there. Um, the problem with that stream is like most urban streams in, in um, New Jersey, that particular heavily industrialized area has had a big impact. So we've been putting in more riffles, more oxygen, more construction, more waterfalls, and then more bank protection and all this good stuff. And then we were sitting there working and a giant snapping turtle went right past us and an eel. So it shows you that there is still life forms in that river. And we as a society are dedicated to doing, making the world a better place, which is where a lot of people are out right now on a march in, uh, against fossil fuels. Uh, and that we do those, we take those things uh, very seriously. So a great summer, good kickoff for that. So really great to see you all here. Thank you. I've seen your picture online, a lot of kind of stuff and heard your voice. It's nice to have you in the building and thank you for coming all this way and bringing your family. There's other cool things to see, but of all the cool things, of course, in New Jersey, uh, coming to see us is important. So um, I have to start off by saying, what do I, heck do I know about an ethic raising ethical kids. I only have one um, disaster. No, just kidding out. Um, I've been a parent only for 11 years. I adopted my son. Uh, and um, that is for a lot of people like, what do you know? We've been around. Did your kids turn out okay? It's all right. It's okay. Thumbs up. Yeah, they're here. So she's being, yeah, she's winking a lot at me, but I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, no, right. And some of you, right, kids, your kids turn out okay? Yeah, yeah, struggle, yeah. Yeah, my, my father said he really attributes his child rearing abilities, this is my dad, to Dr. Benjamin Spock, who wrote the book on child caring. He says it was just big enough and heavy enough to beat us with it successfully. So he said that's, he used to tell that story all the time. And that was kind of their form of child rearing. Uh, I lived in the old school days where the morning would happen, my parents would kick us out the door, lock the door. We were then allowed to come back for lunch. We'd eat, then they would kick us out, lock the door. We could come back for supper, and then they kicked us out and locked the door. We could come back for bedtime. That was child rearing uh, in South Texas uh, for other until I was 30, somewhere around there. So, uh, yeah, it was a lot going on. I've, I've also had the, the 
privilege and the honor to serving as the National Youth Program Director for the National Park Service and the EPA's program called Groundwork. And spent a lot of time traveling to a lot of communities, a lot of time across the United States, working with some very intelligent people on how do we how do we use these talents of the national parks and of the EPA and all of our projects to help actually a better communities. That money started under the Obama administration. Luckily, see there, that's that's how you raise them right. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly it. Something as a surprise, or you just didn't want to yeah, that's right. get rid of it. Yeah, but I think that's yeah, that's the way it should be done. Uh, but that was a big question for us: is how do we use these assets, this money that we have, large amounts of money, large amount of funding, large of assets, to actually help uh, work on the next generation and, and make sure that they have the opportunities. And with that, I was able to bring in lots and lots of smart people, much smarter than I, who had spent years looking at these topics, and then they helped give me uh, their feedback as well. Um, and so I've learned a little bit about that. I've learned that from my own um, child, Andy. Uh, as some of you know, uh, I am a, a, a gay father raising a gay son. And the great thing about that is that we have conversations about many things that other parents and families maybe not get to have. And so it's it's been a lot of big learning experience with me discussing what we call heteronormative behavior, the things that we decided to reject ourselves in our own lives, and then thinking about then how should he live? How should I train him? What do I teach him? I have concerns as all parents do, but we in the gay community and other places have something called Jade, you know, Jade. We don't have to justify, we don't have to argue about it, we don't have to defend or explain anything of our behavior. You know, we just talk about what it is that we are and how we want to be and make those choices. Uh, you can all use Jade as well, too. You don't have to justify it, you don't have to argue about it, you don't have to defend it, you don't have to explain it. You can just be in the world and think about that. And I've learned a, a lot just in this conversations with him about ideas and opinions that impact my own way of looking at reality. We have so many youth today who come to me who are say they're gender fluid or have other uh, uh, choices, life trials, and to help them unpack what that means without also uh, all the other kinds of things that come with it from our societies and of course, fears from the parents. I also have a Dominican son. Uh, Andy, when I first met him, didn't speak English. He spoke only a few words. Uh, and my broken South Texas Spanish was a bit of a challenge for us. Uh, but I've also learned and having gone with him to DR, to the Dominican Republic, being around his family and learning, I've learned a lot about what it means to be white, what it means to have privilege, what it means to be able to trans, uh, travel through that as someone who has money and resources, but also the fact that how Dominicans can be just as racist as anyone else can, uh, and how they can be horrific to the people of Haiti. Uh, and he's very angry and upset about the only comments when we go to Dominican festivals and hear things that get said that are upsetting for both of us. But for him to say to me, why did you just do that? Why don't we just walk into a restaurant like, what did I just do now? The way you look, the way you sat, the way you entered the room, the chair that you selected, the way you greeted the person, the thing that you said, the way you ordered, the way you looked at me, the way you didn't look with me, all these things that have come to me multiple times through my conversations with my son uh, and, and, and just being challenged of what it means to raise a diverse family, which so many of our families are. Many of the families now that come into the ethical society are multiracial, multiethnic, multidiverse, and that's great. And we have these things that happen to us when we walk into a room. We have things that people say to us when Andy and I walk down the street, right? There are all kinds of assumptions that get thrown at us that would both of us find very upsetting. And my response to him is let it go. There's nothing you can do about it. And he doesn't like that response from me. And then the other challenge I have, of course, is that my own son is neurodiverse. Uh, we used to use the term called mental illness, but that's a pathology. He sees the world very differently in many different ways and struggles with the trauma of his own youth. 
Uh, that trauma has impacted him uh, quite a bit, uh, as many youth are today struggling with, with anxiety and depression and many other things that happened to him. Uh, these are things which I deal with on a daily basis as well, dealing with my own son's severe uh, neurodiversity and having to kind of understand what it, it means to be normal. And so all these things have kind of influenced my way of thinking. When I was thinking of this talk this summer, I realized that's in many ways no different than all of you, right? Your kids are different than you in so many ways. Your kids are facing challenges that you've never faced. Your kids think about politics, religion, sexuality, uh, the internet, take it in very, very different ways than you do. And you have to get challenged by that, no matter what age you are, even your grandkids and your kids as they begin to old, 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 they do think differently, they see the world differently, they respond to things differently often, and you will have those challenges your entire life. Does it ever stop? No, it doesn't, right? It continues on. We might as well just give up now and just go to the bar, better use of our time. Um, but yeah, so, it's things that happened to me in my 11 years of being a parent are things that happen to all of you to a certain extent and your own journey. Maybe more amplified to a certain extent, but it's the same conversations. And so from all of this, all of these experiences that we have and all the things I've thought about, how do I use the big funding assets to how do I greet my son in the morning? All those things are, are, are are, are so powerful to us, right? We, we have these beings and all we do, how many of you spend most of your time thinking of these other beings that you have and, and you have raised and you're with? It's amazing how much energy and resources. Why would you breeders even do that? I don't understand that. I just think that's an awful thing. You shouldn't do that. Uh, but here we are and we have these, these, these incredible ex opportunities and these experiences and these wonderful life forms in front of us. And um, we want them to be happy. We want them to be safe. We want them to exceed. We want them to do so many things. And um, that's all these things come together when you're a parent. And I think about with my brother and had conversations with him all the time about this. And, and, and their response, of, of course, is, yeah, it's pain in the ass. That was their thing to me is how difficult it is, but you know, they love it. And all they do is their life is spent with their kids in certain ways. You know, one of the things we say in trauma-informed community practices is a lot to have to do with how we treat kids anyway. So when we, we deal a lot with uh, youth across the United States, often in much more dire circumstances and much more challenges. Uh, we have a problem in America. We, we had this pandemic. We paid a big price of that education. Are schools harder to, be, to deal with now, kids in schools, right? We have increased levels of anxiety. We had uh, kids are just acting out. We've had increased levels of violence and the, these things that have happened. Everybody's already up here and we're there just takes a little bit and suddenly they're making rash decisions and doing all the things that youth do. Uh, and we have to kind of plan collectively as a community that we do have to rate, as they say, the old aphorism, it takes a village. It does take all of us to think about how we're going to raise children. And in trauma-informed community practices, when we're working with youth in a room, and I just saw this this weekend, uh, I was at a construction site, I mean, uh, this week, I was at a construction site supervising, um, and a group of youth came who were supposed to be a core. Now, when you say you're sending you, we're sending you the New Jersey State Corps, that's what they told me. I thought, wow. They're going to be in uniforms. They're going to know what they're going to do. I'm going to not have to not do, you know, I'm a safety officer for, for OSHA. I can don't have to do my full explanation. And here they came in shorts, flip-flops, and attitudes. <laughs> I saw them coming across the bridge, and I'm down there with in the mud, about this deep of mud, and watching this guy bring over this big rock and deplace the rock and all this kind of stuff. And I go, oh, boy, here we go again. Uh, and they came across, one young lady made it across the bridge. She, she said, in very colorful language, but I will translate for you, I'm not doing this. <laughs> it was much more yeah. colorful than that. It was a much more creative way. And then she came up to the supervisor and said in her, I'll translate again, um, you're putting too much pressure on me. Please stop that. Uh, it didn't come quite like that. 
Um, and then uh, th I discovered that this youth uh, were a workforce development crew who also came with numerous challenges. I could hear it in the voice behind me. I had done thing, having done this for 20 years, I already knew what was going on. And so trauma-informed community practices, we start with some basic things. Do those kids feel safe? First thing, right? First thing we do with parents, do they feel safe? And you know it's your own kids when they don't feel safe, they don't feel scared. And so the first thing is, all new things. Sometimes I have to curate the experience and you do too with your parent, with your kids. We spend time curating it, right? This is okay. You're gonna like this. This is what we're doing and all this kind of stuff. And that's part of that to make them feel safe. Do they feel calm, right? When they come in the door, do they feel calm? And they have so much stressors put about there. Part of that is just bringing it down a bit sometimes and you're getting really good at that. And that takes energy for you to do that stuff. Um, Youth do like to feel a little bit in control of their environment. We all do. They don't want to feel trapped. They don't want to feel like everything's just being done. You know, I used to work with groups and we would go to this one school, a famous school in, I won't say their name, Teton Science School. Um, and they used to say, okay, everybody come in. Everybody sit on the floor. And I'm like, oh my God, these are 18, 19 year olds. Okay, uh, if you need, who needs to go coyote, you, there's the bathroom over there. And I'm like, what the hell? And it, it just went downhill from there. And there was no control of their environment. And they kept saying, oh yeah, we wanna make you feel safe and calm. But there was no control of the environment, which includes how you even get spoken to and how you can do that. Also is you know, how important it is that we make sure you feel included. You know, from your own kids, forget it. If you don't include everybody, and we're always trying to figure out a way to do that, you know, that safe, that calm and control in the environment, but a part of the process. But they also, how important is that we help them understand the world around them, right? It's another thing from the trauma-informed community process. I explain to my groups, this is what's going on. This is why we're doing it. This is how things became the way they are. But we also want them, of course, to feel hopeful about the future right? That it's just not all bleakness. If I say, oh, this is the reason why the, this is messed up and damaged and all this kind of stuff, but I say it can be repaired. And so we, we give them that sense of hope that we often do with our youth because you know what it's like when a youth doesn't feel that. But and also importantly, a path to get there. How do you get to that vision of that? So that's what we do just for uh, working with groups of youth those things, trauma-informed, right, stuff. My initial thing is, I just look at, do they feel safe? Do they feel solemn? Do they feel included? Do they, under, do they feel some control in the environment? Do they understand what's going around them? Do they feel included in that process? Before I get to do anything else, that's kind of the first thing that just comes into my mind when I'm working with the youth and how important that is. So we have a lot of problems just to do that. And I'm gonna get to the raising the moral child part, but just, all these things that we have to do with just to make sure that we've created an environment, right? As teachers, you know that, right? We create an environment, a learning place where people can even hear what you have to say and those kinds of stuff. But we have so much problem because of something, and uh, we've come a long way since his work, but a guy named Eric Erickson, you may have heard his name. He wrote a famous book called Identity in the Life Cycle. And he showed many, many important things that youth go through. And we see patterns with youth around these. And one of them, of course, is when children are young, they want to be everything with you. They want to dress like you. They want to do the same things that you do until that magic age when you are everything they don't want to be, <laughs> right? And that the challenge for them, according to Erickson, is the, what's called the differentiation stage, is they're trying to figure out who they are. And everything you say to them feels smothering, right? Oh, I'm close enough, drop me off here. I don't want to even see you dropping me off the school. Oh, yes, but it's still a mile away. That's close enough. Uh, I don't care if my friends see you. And that whole part about differentiation that we all have to go through to figure out who we are. And we struggle with our parents. First of all, they're gonna push every single button you have to figure out what you believe is really real. I'm gonna just 
throw it back at you. I'm going to watch everything that could be perceived as hypocrisy. I'm going to test those boundaries to discover what you're real. And then the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to become uh, some my own self. And you do that, as you know, a very interesting way. The first way of becoming yourself is to dress like other people exactly like them who are not your parents, right? So you go into typical high school. I taught for many years uh, to groundwork in high schools, the science program, and we see the same groups in schools, right? They're the, the jockeys kind of like that, and then the, the gothy, the theater kids, and you know, all these things. And they, they wear this identity. They put these things onto them. And that's the differentiation stage. I want to be something different, especially if it's completely different than my parents. Uh, I want to be this thing, uh, but, uh, but I, I, I don't know who it is or what I want to be in. And that struggle, that differentiation stage, what a struggle that is in most families. Right. Especially when we put so many other societal pressures, like on young ladies and the young ladies and what you're supposed to be and how you're supposed to be. And, and they're trying to go through the differentiation stage. And the next thing, dad's taking the front door off uh, of the bedroom. Right. How many people have done that? And that's not a good choice. My own brother who watches this, you, you know, this is an interesting choice. Um, but just the struggle through differentiation. And you could see that because they want to. And then they look back over their shoulder just to make sure you're still there. And that what a struggle that whole process is. Because the other problem we have is that so much of our reasoning, so much of how we figure things out is dependent upon a fully functional prefrontal cortex, Antonio Damasio said, right? We need this, this emotional regulation part of our brain. When I was a kid, I wanted to be Spock. I wanted to think about, I don't need my emotions. You know, it was hard for me being a closeted kid in South Texas. I knew that if I could squash my emotional side, then maybe then I, you know, it could just be reasonable and those kind of stuff. And we like that, right? So there's nothing very attractive. Until this Italian neuroscientist has said, no, everybody who has damage to their free, prefrontal cortex does terrible decision-making. We need our emotions. We are emotional creatures. Our capacity to reason is dependent on whether or not we have fully functioning emotions. And we have to be in touch and immune with them. Guess who doesn't have a fully functioning emotional regulator? Teenagers, right? They're like brain damaged already. And, and so they don't have this this capacity that helps them to reason. And so we see them acting in ways that we go, wow, that's pretty interesting choice. That's what you say when you're an ethical culture leader. That's an interesting choice that you made there. Um, what you really want to say is like, man, that was pretty stupid, but you can't say that, <laughs> right? Because there it goes. So we just look at them and say, that's an interesting choice. And I'm, I'm sitting there as someone who, who's, who's had some very smart people train me is understanding that yeah there this emotional dysregulation is still going on uh and it may not be fully formed at what age what age does this fully 25 yeah very good we're crazy until we're 25 think about that yeah longer than that <laughs> i've had mine surgically removed uh and so yeah it screws us all up we we Youth make these very, but for us, are very emotional things. And the scariest thing to do is to be sometimes supportive of that craziness. I get you. I understand. I hear you. It's not really quite what I choices I had to make. But I understand that you're still going through this thing that we're helping you to do, uh, to do that. So we have all these problems that we have. So how do you then raise a moral child in all those things? This crazy pressures, all this world, all these things are happening the prefrontal cortex not to be developed. You know, there was a guy named William Bennett who worked under the Bush administration who said, you know what we need to do is we need to go back to basics. He wrote a book uh, on this and he says, we just need Aesop's fables and here we go. You, you eat too many of this and you get sick to your stomach. You, you, you cheat someone and keep yelling, the, you know, the sky's falling and things like this stuff. And he wrote a whole book about it. It was a terrible book from my perspective. <laughs> Absolutely terrible book. Sorry. Linda, Bennett. Wait, uh, wait, let's uh, put this on tape. Yes. My wife and I uh, sent his book to um, her brother, 
because it was about an education and the last name was Bennett. It was, uh, <laughs> Bennett Linda Bennett's daughter. So yeah, um, so you bring that up. Yeah, it was very special. Yeah. The family thing that you, you ruined that entire family, just so you know. Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, so. What's interesting is there's this there's this idea that okay we just need to give the youth here's the problem and here's the solution and here's the problem and here's the solution and how appealing that is that let's just hand them that kind of stuff and we know uh, that that doesn't work actually the guy who founded this movement Felix Adler is more known as an educator in circles and he thought he thought that he already would have known that if had had William Bennett, he'd still been alive when Bennett was around. It's like, that's not how you learn things. You learn them in a much more different process. You know, um, my, my mentor, uh, Arthur Dobrin said, you know, it's like a back door through the emotional matrix, right? You know, uh, that you have to, 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 to build a relationship with you. That's the first thing that you do as a parent, right? That relationship that you have. And then you're talking with them, but just telling them there's what to do works for a while. And then it never works again. <laughs> never works again the rest of your life. But they will listen to you in other ways. And we're going to talk about those kinds of stuff. And so how then do we raise youth to be ethical? And how do we do that as a community? And what are the kinds of things that we're doing? Um, Arthur Dobrin was an ethical, is an ethical culture leader um, at the Long Island Society. He taught at Hofstra University for many, many years. And he was one of my mentors and he had his uh kind of he's written several books some of them they're out there on what he thought youth could do and i thought a lot of that was really really good stuff uh the first thing of course is that when we're trying to raise anyone to be ethical is they need a capacity to reason that is really really important it's our capacity to reason to think through things if we just tell people Here's the reason why. And of course, their question is, their back to us is going to be what? But why? And you're going to say this, and they're going to go, but why? And they're going to keep going to that. But that whole process of that capacity to reason, to the ability that we have to continue to engage in the conversation. And they, they, as you all know, as parents, that you get asked that question a thousand times, all the way up into adulthood, but why? And it comes at lots of things of people trying to reason through these kinds of stuff. And I often see with a lot of young adults that I've worked with who come from very traumatic backgrounds is that that's very difficult for them, especially with no prefrontal cortex delay uh, and all those kinds of stuff, uh, just a kind of a sea of emotions. But also when I hear them, uh, I'll just put a picture out them and say, what's kind of going on in this picture? And I do it in my own way. And I see just a lot of naming. I don't see a lot of kind of putting things together. There's no narrative. There's no, that's one of the things we do to youth with that is help develop that, that kind of narrative capacity to that. If it's really, really difficult, youth do need a way to reason through things. We used to offer an ethical society's philosophy for children. It was really, really great because it was a lot about how to do critical thinking and critical analysis skill and all this kind of stuff. The, the challenge is for young adults who, uh, that, that's a process that takes an entire uh, part of their life and there's so much that we wanna do. The really big thing that we could do as parents is emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence, because that's the part that's being developed, right? So their capacity to reason also needs emotional intelligence. And you know, there's really good ways to do that in a home. The way to do it is you are emotionally intelligent. The more that you can express your own emotions um, and how much emotive language. And it's a fun thing to do. I've done that in families and see them having this conversation and I hear zero emotive language. I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm scared. You know, they'll do the big three, but other complex emotions is really what we want. How much do you use emotive language in your family? How often do you express your emotions? Right? When my parents used to fight, they'd go off into the room and we'd never see that. We could hear them. My God, they could hear them. <laughs> for blocks to go, yeah. Uh, but uh, it, uh, I had the, uh, the ability, though, that my mother was, was 24 years when she had me. I was her fourth kid. Uh, married at uh, 16, first kid at 17. She was a child herself. My mother was a child, and, but she had a very stunted emotional family. 
Uh, they didn't use a lot of motive language, but luckily she found her own way to that. And she could say those things as she got older and older. She had the freedom to use her own emotive language, which allowed us, her children, to use emotive language as well. And you can go to a lot of families and there's no emotional regulation other than angry and happy, the big powerful ones, but all the other hundreds of subtle ways that we humans can express emotions. And that's one of the things that we could do is helping our kids is making sure that we have provide them with those emotionally rich kind of things. The other big one for us, of course, is an internal locus of control. That's the whole thing about being an ethic pro person is when people said, oh, we're not going to give you control over your own life. How can you be an ethical person if you don't have uh, the control of your own life? And for a lot of kids, of course, there is no internal locus of control. I said it, you do it, or I said it, you don't do it. That's it. And then as they get older, we start to say, we begin to negotiate with you. That's a really, really good thing. Sometimes it's successful. Sometimes it's not successful. It's because they can get really, really good at playing that game really fast. Uh, but learning how to negotiate to do that internal locus of control. You know, they did a study of children of, of uh, alcoholics, and I've been fascinated with mental illness. I've had other people I've worked with closely who are mentally ill, and I, uh, my own um, postgraduate work was in mental is in uh, counseling and things like that. And looking at children who come from homes with a lot of uh, either alcohol or, or drug abuse or something like that with parents and completely out of control. And... What's interesting was they looked at these children, the children of alcoholics or the children of people of drug abuse or mental illness, is that how much fatalism existed. Well, things just happen. I have no control over them. You hear them as adults. They're either going to happen. They're not going to happen. And they look at this and they think, you know, what is the commonality with these youth? And how many of them said, well, you know, when I was a kid, you'd walk in the door and say, look, I got a A on my school paper. And you got this over effusive amount of emotional uh, attention. And the next time you came in, you showed an A, you got slapped upside your head. There was never a way to play the game. There was never any rules. They couldn't, the kids couldn't figure out how to work the system in a way to make it happen. And so therefore, as adults, they go, well, everything's just up to fate. Nothing you can do. And how important it is that we provide those children with those internal locus of control and the ability to do that. The other thing that Arthur said is our ability to develop relationships. Now, some of us like people, some of us don't. I'm the don't like them too. Uh, there, you know, we, our ability to develop relationships is so important and how incredibly important that is for ethics, that ability to make connections to that. That's based on the famous Olinner study of people who rescued uh, Jews during World War II, and the owners were parasociologists, and they were trying to figure out why did some people rescue Jews and others didn't. They looked at education, they looked at money, they looked at politics, they looked at all these things. <laughs> Hello, there goes Skyler hey? <laughs> and McKinsey. Uh, and they looked at all of these things, and they tried to find commonality, and they couldn't find anything that was common. They couldn't say it was because of education they couldn't, because it wasn't politics, you know, people in the, both the right and the left, and they couldn't find anything. And then they asked him, why did you do what you did? And the person home in office said, oh, I knew them, or I had a connection with them, or I felt, you know, I, I knew someone like them, and I made that connection. How important relationships are to do that. And so how important for us to make sure that our youth can make a relationship. And that's the scariest thing as a parent, to sit there and watch your youth interact with a bunch of other youth, and you're going, please somebody say hi, please somebody say hi, please somebody say hi, right? You know that? You know what I'm talking about? And that whole thing, and because uh, kids with emotional dysregulation in many ways can be brutal to each other, they can also be incredibly sweet. Uh, and so, but how important that is capacity. And we need to continue to work on that our whole lives. Yes, this is what it means to be a friend, because I'm a friend and I'm doing this stuff. And that goes saying when we say community relationships, we also mean participation in community. How important that the youth are running in out of the door, having some orange juice. Yeah. Uh, put you on the spot there. 
and, and but just to feel like yeah you're part of something you can come in and feel welcome and get you know have this connection and feel like you're engaged and a lot of parents aren't doing that anymore right the number of people who are joining communities is plummeting in the united states is it true are people community based over in holland or is it happening there as well yeah, but in the United States, it's almost like a, an epidemic of people dropping out of communities. And therefore, we're just joining people who look only exactly like us and have part of that. The other thing is the reciprocity. And that's the hardest thing for you to get is I give something to you or I do something you had to give it back. That's a hard one. That takes a lot of years to develop even in adults. And that's why it's important when you're a member of a community that goes apple picking and then talks about these things and makes the applesauce and then give those backs and raise those kind of stuff. And the final thing Arthur said was how important it is the habit of action. You know, they did a study of all these people who went into soup kitchens. I told you this story before, and they want to know what makes people volunteer. And I don't mean we come in with a little bit of liberal guilt. I'm there for a few hours. And then I go, this is okay. We're going to go do something else. And then they're gone. And they never come back again. We're talking about those people you met who volunteered in the same place for 20 years and have did that. And they'd go and they'd look at those people like, okay, what is the magic? Why are you there? Why have you done this for a long time? And they go, oh my God, my parents used to drag me out to these stupid social action projects where I had to mow the darn grass of the old lady next door. I hated it. But that habit, of action and how important that is because as adults some of us go well this is just what you do right i was luckily raised in a in a household uh that didn't do too much that because we lived out in the country alone from other words but they my parents were constantly trying to create other kinds of ways that we were supposed to help out and get involved and do that and how important those things so those kind of things are what Arthur saw, uh, uh, their capacity to reason, their emotional intelligence, an internal locus of control, the ability to develop and foster relationships, the comfort with diverse community, building reciprocity and have of action. He thought those things all played a crucial role. And to a certain extent, I totally absolutely agree with him how important that is. We create this learning circle. So before y'all came in here, we had another group in here and that group, uh, that's what we try to do, is just talk about what does it mean to be a member of the community. So they, they do their own little build community activity that we do something around names so we can do that. We'll do something around fostering relationships or on emotional intelligence, or we'll plan events and activities where they go and actually do kind of stuff. We'll point out the needs for diversity and also thinking about the world outside the door, how important that is for them. So these are all important things. The only thing I said to Arthur is, is I believe that it's just that for us to decide what does it mean to be ethics? What does it mean to be an ethical person? That's going to vary quite a bit. And the truth is a lot of times what we think of as ethical are actually personality traits. Oh, you waste too much time. Oh, you don't enjoy life enough. Oh, you... Uh, you should you should spend for the future or you should live for the moment or you should do these things. And you're listening to those go, those are personality differences. Is that really an ethics? And a lot of what we say it, about what children should do, I hear these, these conservative people often speaking about what they do. And I go, no, that's what you like to do. This is how you are. This is where your comfort level is. That's what I really hear you saying. And what you're saying is to those kids is you should be exactly that way. And those are really just personality differences. And, and how much of it is that? If I get to what I think of what, a, what is ethics for me and what does it mean to be a good person about that? I think it's what is your capacity to that child for me? And this is me speaking. What is that child's capacity to create spaces where life can flourish? including their own, that spaces. What is the work that they're capable of doing to build spaces where we can all feel uh, good and things like that? And here's the difficult thing, and I'm not gonna end with this. Uh, I used to be a big fan of something uh, called the growth mind model. Does anyone know what the growth mind model is? You've heard in schools. And in schools, we highlight it all the time. And there's some really, really cool things about the growth mind model. And the idea is that if you think youth, uh, if you come in, you say, well, you're not going to be very good at this. 
children aren't very good at whatever it is going to be. This is essentially, and it's much more complex than that. But when we help children believe that they're smarter and that they can understand and that they can engage, and we give them that positive learning environment, growth mind model says they're more likely to achieve. And I believe that 90%. Because the research that came after that says, you know, for 10 years, I mean, we've been doing the growth mind model. Yay, you can do this. You're smart. You're intelligent. You're great. I think you're fantastic. Get in there, man. I'm, I'm come on. We could, we're counting on you. I believe in you. Youth do. But then they found out that if they didn't do the work, the math, they didn't do the homework, all of our cheerleading, no matter what we do, still didn't make them better in school. That's what the research came out from that. It's important that we look at them and say, you can do it, but ultimately the youth has to do the work themselves. They have to do the work. We can't just be cheerleaders. And so much of what I see in, in ethics and all this kind of stuff, especially in the liberal community, I'll say where are we at, there's a lot of cheerleading, not enough saying you need to put the work in. I think that's something that we need to make sure that we're not following. on. To me, ethics is a verb. It's the things you do. It's not just the things you believe or hope for. We hope for this and we hope for that and we hope for this and we hope for that but we're not doing the work. And if the youth don't do the work, they'll never be able to do the work. And how important that is for us to make sure that's, that's happening. Um, so I want to kind of end with that. Uh, I'm at, it's very interested in hearing what you have to think about this stuff because there's many different ways of raising kids and they all are valid in cert to a certain extent. Uh, they all have their thing because we're trying to meet that person where they are. And that's the thing I've learned from my own neurodiverse youth, that all of the things and all of the theories that are out there only matter what works for that person and how relationship I have and the willingness that any of us are really to modify to make sure that they continue just to take steps forward and to move forward and how important that is. So thank you for that. And we're gonna hand it back to Eric. Thank you so much, Kurt. Really very uh, lively and insightful. And um, it, it gave me some pause and some, uh, maybe a little nostalgia. My son is uh, 19 now. And so he's sort of, it, it's always a transition phase, I think, but, you know, this is an interesting transition phase to see him in and to hear some of the, your, your points and to reflect upon them. And I also want to say how happy I am to hear a happy gurgling baby in our midst again. Thank you, Rihanna, who's uh, here from visiting us from the uh, Westchester uh, Ethical Society for this program today. And it's been since my son was one year old, which he was when we joined, um, and he would sit in the back uh, and be that happy gurgling baby. So it's really, it's a pleasure and a, and a joy and gives me happy memories to think of that. Um, so without further ado, uh, I thank you, Kurt, again, for your comments. Uh, I don't know, do you want to have a, a, any colloquial time here for? have an update for resonations for people to say Good. Uh, they're all getting stuff not missing. But... Great. And I don't know what happened to our microphone. Right. It's to my right. Here it is. Thank you. Uh, and so, yes, I, I, I would like to open it up and invite uh, people to share any uh, resonation that it has for them, that Kurt's uh, comments have had for them. So please feel free. Or Thank you. Or things to add. Thank you. Go ahead, Sam. Thank you. I thought that was really a fantastic talk. And uh, I just wanted to say, like, so uh, we ended up in a very bizarre situation with a family who I will say is unethical. And we kept getting into situations that we found extremely challenging. I'll give you one example, because it was a tiny moment, but it still sticks with me. We went apple picking and there was um, like a area of the apple orchard that was cordoned off because they didn't want you to go there. And the mother said, ah, and climbed over the line and I followed her. 
And we picked the apples from the area that they had cordoned off. And it still, I mean, that was like 10 years ago. And it still bugs me because it was this tiny little moment. But with this family, there were tons of these tiny little moments that we would have to then, our daughter would go to the house. She'd come to our house and we'd be, oh, no, that's not true. No, no, that's not the way we think about the world. No, we don't believe that. And it forced us to identify and push back on a lot of things. And that's just a tiny example. But I believe my mom, a lot of you know my mom, really um, took pride in leading by example. And I feel like that's a responsibility that we have too. So there. Thank you so much, Shan. Jerry, go ahead. And then we'll take a couple from Zoom. I grew up with ethical culture. I know what ethical culture can mean to young people, particularly teenagers. I don't see anything close to it now. And when I have some time or you have some time, I'd like to share the experiences that I had uh, being involved in ethical culture. I'll just very quickly say it was a team, group of teenagers with some extraordinary adults, but the bottom line is we did everything. The adults stayed in the background in case you know you're going to get something that's dangerous. We never did, and we uh, I got to as president of, of the youth group. I got to select the topics for our, our in, um, overnight uh, Hudson Guild adventures. Now I'll tell you the two topics that we dealt with um, in my era was sex. And the other one was loneliness, both very powerful, which most people would die away from, but teenagers got involved in it immediately. So maybe sometime in the near future, I can share that experience. Because unlike when I do, sometimes people say, we can't do it, the world has changed. Well, freak it. We have control of the world we have at least control over our own lives and we can't give that control away the way we're doing right now. Thank you, Jerry. Fortunately, the world has not changed so much that teenagers don't still concern themselves about sex and loneliness. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, let's uh, turn it over to Zoom. And I see that we have Pam on Zoom with your hand raised. Would you like to share a reflection, uh, something that resonated with you? Thank you very much. This was a really important program for me this morning because I have a grandson who's 13 years old, 13, that age when 13 year olds are not in control of themselves. Um, and my grandson has had many, many problems over the last year, but my daughter has seeked out help for him and he is finally coming around. But what he has to understand or what we always try to impress upon is his intelligence. He is the most amazing, intelligent little boy I've ever met. He plays chess. I mean, chess is something that's very hard for a child to understand. His background in mathematics and his love for math and computers has really helped him deliver excellent potential. And now he has finally realized, I am going to do well in school this year and I'm gonna do all my homework and all the things I need to do to do well. So please help me impress upon my grandson to do well this year and anything that I can do to help him ethically will be my pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you, Pam. Susan, I see you, uh, your hand is raised. Yep. Thank you. 
Uh, something that resonated with me that as you were speaking, Kurt, was about the focus on relationships. I think that, uh, you know, we're kind of uh, where the situation is in the world today and certainly in America, that the polar um, aspect of of where we are, we don't know how to talk to each other anymore about controversial items being on on one side or the other. And I think it really, uh, if we're going to change this, we've got to change it at at the um, child level and start teaching how to talk when uh, we don't always agree and how do we have meaningful conversations and that just deepens relationships so um i i see uh, a bright future hopefully <laughs> for our kids thank you thank you susan anyone else to come back to the room anyone else care to care to share a reflection uh or a resonation from kurt's talk today None in the room. Anyone else on Zoom? I see no other hands. All right. Well, thank you all so much for uh, joining us. And thank you again, Kurt, for your very inspiring, informative talk. Um, really uh, useful and uplifting. To learn more about us, visit our website, ethicalfocus.org, or email us at admin at ethicalfocus.org, and we'll get back to you. To make a donation, go to ethicalfocus.org slash donate. Please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and you can watch many of our past programs on our YouTube channel.